Hey, this is Matt Cuthbertson from Untimely Demise into Eternity and Ravenwich, and I'll see you at the Tampa Morgue. What's up? This is Tony, and you're listening to the Tampa Morgue, episode number 53. And as always, I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Ed Webb. What's up, dude? Mr. Anderson, what's going on, brother? Not much, man. Episode 53. It seems like uh, we're starting to get up there a little bit. <laughs> you would have thought, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, I mean, but how's everything going on your end over in Tampa? Good. Everything's good, man. Just raining. Raining a lot. Yeah, this that we kind of threw this episode together in the last two days, actually, because act, what the guy we have coming on tonight, our guest, actually, you've been, you've toured with him, um, your friends with him. We've actually he's done recordings for us on our record, uh, did a guest spot and stuff. So, you know, we have Matt coming on from Untimely Demise, um, and yeah, I mean, into eternity, into eternity, into eternity, yeah, yeah. You know, he's going to come on the show, tell us all about that. Contacted him last minute. 
um, and just kind of threw it together. So looking forward to have him on. We actually opened up the show with Untimely Demise. Uh, Spiritual Embezzlement was the name of the song off the album Systematic Eradication from 2013. We'll talk to him in a few minutes. Um, Ed, anything anything going on really, man? I mean, we just we just not, had a show really. a couple days ago, so yeah, nothing nothing new that uh like show wise or anything like that. Just just fucking chilling. I'm considering going to a show next week. Last minute, uh, it's in Orlando, but Lamb of God and Mastodon are playing, and I I found out that Mastodon's playing their whole Leviathan record. And I didn't even hear Lamb about that. Yeah, Lamb of God's playing the Ashes of the Wake record in full. So I guess that's the trend now. After 20 years, you play your, your you know, full records. So I think you kind of got to. I, I was telling you, I picked up tickets for me and my wife to see Wasp in Orlando. Um, we actually play the night before, me and you. But I'm going to take the wife to see Wasp. It's the same deal. They're playing the whole first record. You know, it's. I think that's kind of yeah. the thing it's now. The thing, man. You're getting older and people want to hear it. And for me, Leviathan's my favorite record that they did. So, uh, definitely, I'm, I'm, like, real close, man. I mean, the thing is, it's like an hour and 20 minutes away. Because it's at the uh, Orlando Amphitheater. I think that's what it said. And, uh, yeah, I'm just like, man, do I really want It's a Wednesday. Like, and the show starts at 5. The, the other cool thing about it is uh, the opening band's called Malevolence. Mm, they're all right. Not, I, I haven't heard that. Not groundbreaking. Or- Definitely not groundbreaking, but um, Kerry King's playing, you know, his band. And kind of oh, on this, that, that same show in Orlando. This, those are, they're yeah. going to be playing. Kerry King's, yeah, Kerry King, they're to the second band. And then Mastodon and Lamb of God's the headliner. So, yeah, I'm, you know, tickets are 53 bucks, man. And I'm like, man, you, that's a pretty good lineup for that. You know, now we're talking like how $53 is a great price for tickets. You know, it's fucking stupid. I was surprised when I think I paid for two tickets. I paid, it was, you know, it was like 38 bucks a ticket, but by the time you're done with all the fees and stuff, it was like 120 or some ridiculous thing for, um, but Wasp hasn't come around here in Lithuania for a while. So I figure since we're going to be in Florida for a few months, you know, why not hit it up? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, I've never seen Wasp bad. I haven't seen him in years. I think the last, I saw him on the Golgotha tour when they played at the state theater was the last time. Um, wow. but you know, how many times you always got to wonder how many more times are these bands going to tour? Um, I actually was, I just saw that. You remember, you know, Satan from the UK, they're putting out a new record in September 13th on September 13th. You think about it, that that band has been around since what? Like, I think they, the first demos was like 81 or something like that. I mean, original um, lineup. Yeah. Original lineup. Courtney act was like 83, uh, just a, a great band, but they were in Florida recently, but they have a new album called coming out called songs and crimson. So, I mean, they keep on rolling. And I did see Pete actually speaking of shows. <laughs> Pete, We've talked about this band, me and you, off the show. Pete booked Cancer Christ on September 15th with Flagman at the Conduit. Yeah, I did see that. That would be a cool show to see. I, I've it'd definitely be entertaining. Um, I don't know much. You know, I would totally have one of those guys on the show. I've, I, I've seen him do a few interviews, Cancer Christ, but I saw that he booked that. And me and you had just talked about them probably like two months ago. Yep. Um. July 30th, which you've mentioned on this show, you have Left to Die playing with Intoxicated, uh, Verlins, and uh, Pon- I don't want to say the name wrong, but I probably will, Pontifax. Or, um, and then that's what that's July 30th. I'm sure you're going to be at that show too, probably. Probably. And what else did I Another see here? Driving to Orlando. You know, those days used to be fun to do that. <laughs> not, not so much. Have you so, been to the new conduit since they like, well, that's not. What, that's, since they that's changed it from the reasons. Haven? To the condo. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I would go is I have not been there. So it would be kind of cool to check it out. And yeah, they moved the bar and stuff, as uh, Pete told us when he came on our show. I also saw what Monday, September 2nd, as a at the Brass Mug, Self God, Forest of the Witch, Witch Kill, Marcus the Carcass, and the Bloody Nuns. And that's a tour, I think, for Self God. Um, what else here? July 26th, 2024, Forest of the Witch again, withdrawn from humanity, vast decline at the brass mug for 10 bucks. Uh, I noticed too, you know, back when we were doing shows, a lot of it was like five bucks a show, and everything, even shows have gone up now. I mean, the prices on everything goes up, and it makes sense because everything else has gone up gas and everything. But you know, we used to do man, how many five dollar shows did we do, especially at the Foo Bar? Places like yeah. that, you know, for sure. 
Yeah, we did a lot of those. It's weird to think that what didn't seem like it was that long ago. You know what I mean? And and here it is, where fucking shows are ten bucks for local bands, or for, I've seen even fifteen bucks. Yeah, it's it's up there now. I mean, it's just I think it's the the norm for me. I, I'm like it's kind of crazy to see, but I think that's just the way it is now. You know, I mean, and you know, national shows like you said, some of these shows like we don't, and me and you don't even buy like. I'm sure some of these, like the Rolling Stone tickets and stuff, like five hundred dollars a piece, six hundred dollars a piece, and probably that's actually probably for like nosebleeds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, my wife's, you know, we've talked. She's the country chick, and uh, uh, what the hell was his name? Uh, something Waller, Wallen. Um, Der- what the fuck is his Wallen name? Jennings? Or- no, his his last name's Wallen. He's huge. I understand. Um, he has all these songs. Every time I'm in the car, I hear these same fucking songs. But he's good. I mean, you know, I mean, got to give the guy credit. But they, he was playing Raymond James uh, Thursday and Friday, or Friday and Saturday. And uh, I guess Friday they played fucking packed. Saturday rained out because of, I mean, it's outside of Tampa State, apparently, you know, the lightning. And so. Oh, I saw it. Yeah, I did see something like that online. And, and uh, the guy opening for him is Jelly Roll. And, you know, obviously that dude's made a huge name for himself. And uh, he's actually a quite – I watched a uh, thing on him on Netflix. He's a great dude. I mean, he's drug addict, drug, you know, in and out of jail, you know, good dude. Um, but he – there's a place called the Dallas Bowl in Tampa. Everybody's heard of the Dallas Bowl. It's a country bar. But if you had tickets, a uh, Morgan Waller, Wallen is this guy's name, Morgan Waller. If you had a ticket to the show, you could go to the Dallas Bull and Jelly Roll went over there and played. That's cool, man, for yeah. a dude that huge to just show up and, and still honor a show. I've never heard Jelly Roll. I've heard of him, but I've never heard him. And I've, he, you know. So he he had like he's all his songs are on. Like, it's crazy. He's been on the, the, the 98 Rock He's on the country channel. He's on the hip hop channel. It's like, here's a guy that struck gold because his songs are played everywhere. So I give him credit, man. He's a big dude, too. Like a big dude. Like a person, name, yeah. big dude. But, um, but super you nice. Your fans, man. People remember that shit. I mean, you talk about it all the time. You something. You that remember guy that right there. He's cool and who's not. He, like, absolutely does not take his fans for granted. And that's a rarity. You know what I mean? Very few people give a shit about their fans. But, yeah, that's how that rolls, man. Jelly Roll is a uh, it's a big dude here, so he's uh, definitely not my type of stuff. But, hey, works. Yeah, no, like I said, I've heard the name, haven't heard of him. Um, and like I said, we're going to get Matt hooked up here. We're going to get him all set up and everything. But, you know, Ed, I was thinking, you know, like when you think of Canadian bands, like what are some of the bands that you think of? Like, because, you know, we – I mean, I go right old, to Razor, like of course. School, but for me, Voivod and De- uh, Dead Brain Cells; those are like the two I grew up on in yeah. the early days. Well, um, what was the first Dead Brain Cells? That was '87. I want to say it goes yeah, way back. Yeah, man, that and that record because uh, he he played bass and sang, and between him, Phil Rind, a couple of those guys coming out in the early days, I realized because everybody always says, "Oh, I started playing because of Gene Simmons." Not me, man. I, those guys were the ones that really, like, I saw, okay, this is cool. This is different. I can play and sing, and it's it's a different thing. And you could actually hear that there was killer bass playing along with the vocals. So for me, it just kind of, that's what launched me. You know, I know a lot of people like to scream about Gene, which th- he was not, not an influence, but those guys for sure. Uh, yeah, damn, you had Exciter, Gorguts. I mean, the name. Yeah, Gorguts too, man. Blasphemy, who I used to, you know, back in the day, I really liked them. Um, you know, but we're going to actually, we're going to get Matt set up from Untimely Demise. We're actually going to play a track from Untimely Demise right now. We're going to play uh, Virtue of, in Death off the City of Steel record from 2010. And we'll be back with Matt in a few minutes here. <laughs> Take 
right back on the Tampa Morgue, and that was Untimely Demise uh, with Virtue and Death off the City of Steel 2010 record, and we are joined by Matt from the band. What's up, dude? Hey, man. Good to see you guys. Uh, it's It's been a minute. Well, never uh, met you in person, Tony, but uh, for Ed and I, you know, it's probably been a cool decade since we saw each other in 2014, person. right? That's yeah, yeah. crazy, right? I yeah, because mean... yeah, we had a bunch. Of, I, if I remember correctly... Because we did the European tour where we opened for you guys. And that was 2014 yep. too, wasn't it? I, yep. yep. I it was either was the end of 13 or the beginning of 14. Oh, because yeah, you, yeah, sure. you met Ed in Calgary, right? Or yeah. Edmonton. Well, I remember. That was, the, that was the first That was the first massacre shows. We did two shows. One was like a benefit show. The, uh, we played another one in Calgary. And then we got added the third show with you guys up in um, Edmonton. Yep, Edmonton. Yep. And yeah, because I didn't even know anybody who was playing on the show. And I remember Eric, because Eric yep. Greif was your guy too. And we played the show and I remember you guys came on and I went to Eric. I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? Like, this sounds like creator fucking some of the kill, most killer shit I've heard in years. And I went and got a shirt. I remember I told Eric, I got to get a fucking shirt from these dudes. And you guys gave me a bunch of shit. I was going to buy it, but you gave it to me. And I mean, I was hooked. After seeing you guys, it was intense. It was Ed got a hold of me during that tour. We were talking, and he's yeah, like, "Dude, there's this fucking like, band," and yeah, yeah. Cause, and I bonded with you and, and uh, uh, Murray, 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 big yeah. time. I mean, it was crazy. And even even later on, when uh, we did the tour, Corey, because you had Corey at the time, and um, yeah. it was we had. I mean, I talked to Rick Roz every so often now. Yeah, and we go back to the fucking bunk bed scene and that fucking thing with our driver and oh, the fucking, the hammer, the fucking, it was just like summer camp, metal dude, summer was, camp in it, Germany. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, yeah, it was good. And you guys just, I mean, every night you rip and, uh, you know, that's, that doesn't happen very often. Sometimes oh. you, you see a band and you're like, eh, whatever, but no, I was blown away. It was killer. Yeah. I could totally, uh, just going back to that, uh, I think it was the Edmonton show because we did the Chuck uh, Schuldiner birthday bash or whatever. And, you know, I remember that was the first time I saw you guys and I freaking blown away by just the tightness and the, like the, the heaviness. Then we played the Edmonton show. And I remember, remember Eric saying like, Hey, you got a, a new fan or whatever. And it's like the singer of massacre. And we were just so stoked. And yeah, when you were wearing our shirt on stage that, you know, that it was just like one of those, those moments where you, I always say with music, like you just have to like appreciate the small victories and always forget about, you know, the, the failures. Cause that's just the nature of it. But that was like a really cool moment for us. We're like, Oh man, they like us or whatever. And it just, yeah, that was su super cool. And then the fact that you guys were, were nice dudes, you know, which is always, always a, a pleasure. You know, you don't want to meet, you know, some people you look up to most of the time just cause a lot of people are warped assholes and jackasses and high heels. But yeah, it was, it's cool where we were just, you know, like old friends right out of the gate and it was just awesome. And yeah, then getting to do the European tour was super cool because like, again, for a little Canadian, you know, band that could, you know, opening up for massacre in Europe, all of these fans are very skeptical, you know, when you get on stage and, you know, it's not like we all look like the most commanding individuals either. So, you know, you get on stage and you got, a, you know, a bunch of metalheads from Europe looking at you and it's intimidating, but man, is that, uh, it's that exhilaration that uh, is super fun too. And, and you rise to the top. Like you said, dude, yeah. one thing that you mentioned that's so true is that when you, through years that you would do a band for so long, like, you know, we've been, me and Ed have been doing a band for almost 20 years. Um, there's a lot of downs. There's a lot of shitty moments, but you, the best parts is when you think of all the, the cool times. And that is the most important thing because you can't go by the, the bad experiences because how many times you, when you're first, when you like start out, you're playing shitty clubs sometimes there's nobody there, uh, you know, but then you start you keep on going, man. And it just really, the, the high points are just, you know, the oh, things you have to remember. And, and then you, you have play to Melbourne, realize. you play Melbourne where you drive two and a half hours for nothing. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, I've had, had a lot of those where, you know, you've put in sometimes 10, 12 hours of driving to get to the show. And then it's that classic where you get to the bar early on and you're like, oh, it'll start filling up. And then it gets closer to the show. And you're like, I don't think it's going to fill up. And then there's some <laughs> goober promoter that, you know, 
is a joke. And he's like, oh, man, that's weird that people aren't here. And it's like, well, you, you didn't promote it. You didn't do anything. And you wonder, you, there, you, there's no posters in the venue. No or flyers. Like, I wonder why no one's here. And it's just I made like, a Facebook page. I don't know what happened. But yeah, yeah, you get sick of dealing with that stuff. But then it's such a pleasure. Like earlier this year, we kind of played some really cool shows. Like that Manitoba Metal Fest was really awesome because – Three Inches of Blood just got back together. They're, they're, you know, kind of seminal Canadian traditional heavy metal band. And they just got back together and um, things are kind of just getting, you know, going again after all the nonsense from the last five years. So like the venues are full again and stuff. And it was cool getting to play. Like I played with both Untimely Demise and Into Eternity that night. And it was a, you know, full, full to the nuts sold out show. And it's just like, yes, this is what, this is what it's about, you know, when you you can feel the crowd or, you know, you finish a song and just that the sound of the crowd almost hits you in the face, you know, like and just that kind of stuff, man. It's so affirming. And you're like, that's why I didn't give up this many times. Yeah. Well, you know, and actually, let's we'll start out with your beginning, because, you know, we always kind of start out with that on the show usually. So you're born in uh, Saskatoon, right? On yeah. in 83. That's correct. Yeah. I'm 41. Nice, You're a little bit younger than us. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw eighty three. I said, oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, like, growing up, and but not even like as a kid. Like, what do you remember about growing up there? Oh man, it's just like a small little city with a river. So, just you know, all the like classic, you know, like stand by me type of stuff. You know, you and your buddies biking by the rivers, making you know, like making little forts, you know, with your your pocket knives and doing all all that kind of shit, and then eventually me and my brother got into skateboarding and snowboarding that was kind of like our main thing where just we would watch uh, vhs tapes of skateboarding and snowboarding and the cool thing was um they had all this like punk rock yeah. and heavy metal like oz i remember hearing ozzy osbourne or like you know even california punk bands like pennywise and face to face and just hearing that stuff and I was like, oh, this is so cool. And that kind of brought me into the heavier music. You know, I started like a lot of people like Green Day and, and certain things like that. And then just eventually got more into the, you know, I heard Iron Maiden and Megadeth. And, and then that's when I was like, oh, man, we got to we got to do that type of music. Like that's even cooler than punk. And, but yeah, well, those, so it was like those yeah, skate videos were huge for bands. Snowboard. Yeah, and then just like got more into the music because we were introduced through the the skateboard and snowboard videos, and then pretty much once I got a guitar, that was you know locked my bedroom door for the next fifteen years and learned how to play gradually. Well, you mentioned those skateboard videos. I remember back then, like the Pennywise and the Dwarves, all those old punk bands. It was huge for them. Like just and the, this, but... the, yeah, the scene was so cool at the time because like again, I was probably fifteen, sixteen, so bar shows weren't an option for me but you know for some reason the punk bands were able to do you know all ages bar shows or i don't know how they did it but i was able to see a lot of the bands and that helped you know sway me to like that music because you can actually see it and again you're feeling the energy you know the smell of the cigarettes and body odor it's it's all part of the deal definitely you know it's and you're obviously you must be a hockey guy too i think you're what you're a jets fan Oh yeah, yeah. I like hockey. Like that's just that. It's you pretty much have to like hockey if you're Canadian. You know, it's yeah, it's not an option. But I, I like the proximity teams around me. So your your Jets and your Edmonton Oilers and and to a lesser extent the Flames are kind of the ones that I cheer for. I remember actually we were talking about Eric earlier. Uh, Eric Greif, he was a big Calgary fan. I remember he was telling yeah. me, big Flames fan. Um, so you, when you're growing up, you mentioned. So you like the okay, let's start when you started playing guitar first. Do you remember when you actually first like the first piece of music that you heard to actually like kind of caught your attention where you were just like I wanted to learn more about this like no matter what it was. It would have been um, what there's a few songs uh, Green Day Basket Case. I remember learning that one kind of you know by ear on this shitty um, like Tobacco Sunburst you know Fender Strat fake guitar and it didn't stay in tune and I remember like I had like a it was like a audio cassette that had like the tones that you could try and tune your guitar, you know, by ear. But like, I had no, no knowledge of that, but yeah, it would have been green day. And then, you know, that band I'd mentioned face to face, they were like, I, no, I can't Either face to band. face. Yeah. So, yeah. It was, it was that kind of stuff. And then, you know, eventually uh, it would have been, I know, um, what was it? 
There was a Metallica. You know that. Fade to black. Yeah, fade to black. That was that was probably the first kind of really cool metal riff I learned. What was your first guitar? My first guitar. It was like again a, sh- a red uh, with white pickguard washburn, and it kind of was just like a Fender Strat, you know, fake, you know, whatever you want to call it, but. It was pretty cool. And then we had we had uh, a lot of crate amps. I don't know if you remember them, but they oh, yeah. they were a thing at the time and just solid state. But it had really really good distortion and and uh, you could you know had reverb. And I've always kind of been a reverb junkie when it comes to the the lead tones. Now, are you two? What are you two years older than Mary? No, or he's he two old, years he's older, older than me. Older than you? So I'm eighty three. He's eighty one. Okay, so when did so did you guys both start on guitar? Or I know he's he plays the bass, but I mean, did he start out getting get with the bass or? Well, I was ba- like Murray had actually moved to uh, to BC at the time. I was still in high school, and me and a buddy, uh, it was like uh, two guitars, me and another guy, and then a drummer. And uh, basically, Murray wasn't like liking. He wasn't comfortable out in BC, and you know, didn't know what to do. And I was like, "Man, come back! You know, I'll teach you how to play bass, and we're gonna start this band." And that was kind of the the initial of it. You know, I just I didn't really know how to play, but we just kind of started. And we initially started playing shows, but then uh, eventually, it was me and Murray that got that bug for you know all of the other stuff that goes into bands. You know, like getting you know posters made and logos and you know making connections and you know getting your songs on the radio and all these things you know it it started where it just every day me and murray would have coffees and do business plans of how we could take our band to the next level like it was a classic case of this is all all we wanted to do you know and we did what we could to to do it and with Untimely Demise, so there was like two, so basically 99, right? You guys put together, it was Untimely Demise, which was actually the first formation of it. You guys were a punk band at first. Yep. Yeah. So again, it was just kind of ripping off all of that uh, California sound, you know, your no effects and bad religion and descendants kind of stuff like that. But we always liked that. But then we wanted to have the shredding leads in there as well. Like that was always a thing, even from the, the get go. It's like, it was still punk music, but then there would be like this well-conceived you know like solo that was put in the song what was your first lineup in that band do you remember like was it was it you yeah, so, murray like three of you yeah, or four yeah it was me and murray and then another guitar player matt haynes and he was kind of like the he was the actual good guitar player at the time he knew how to play and i always looked up to him he actually plays in in my traditional heavy metal band now called raven witch so we got back together about you know 20 20 years later or whatever because he never really wanted to do it full time you know it was kind of just a you know a thing like a hobby or whatever and, and me and murray always wanted to get to the next level but yeah so it's me matt haynes uh murray and then the original drummer was called tim mcfarland he was just a high school friend and yeah and who came up with the name on uh, tommy demise well it was kind of a mix uh because uh it was a, a, an ongoing joke for whatever reason. I would, I just thought that was a funny term and, and so did Matt Haynes. So we would always put it in every single essay that we wrote. We would slip it into everyone at school and, and then we're like, oh, that would be a cool name. And, and just kind of the, the thought of, you know, just with music, you know, your Jimi Hendrix and all the, you know, the death by misadventure. And they, it kind of goes hand in hand with rock and roll. So we, we felt it was cool and like it was for a punk band, it was almost too heavy. But then when we became a metal band, it's like, oh, yeah, this this works now. And some of the venue guys, when you guys were playing, what, 99, what were some of the venues that you remember in the, that area growing up? So the best one, this one I miss so much. It was called the Jazz Basement. It was downtown Saskatoon. And it was kind of, you know, you would have everything from, you know, like guys like back in the day, B.B. King and stuff would play, you know, like cool blues and, you know, like, you know, cool, like blues musicians would play it. But then there would be the punk bands and then, you know, it's just kind of a carry all for everything. I think the first time we ever played that, it was for like a high school talent show and we covered some bad religion or something. And uh, but yeah, it was really cool because, again, it was licensed all ages. And when this when this venue went under, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, it was sad because Saskatoon never really got another licensed all ages venue. And I, I feel that that hurt the scene and still one of the things that sucks because it's like unfortunately yeah not everyone drinks but some people do like having a beer or whatever with the show and it's kind of 
some people won't go to the all ages shows, yeah. you know, if they can't have a beer and this and that, it's just, yeah, that, that's frustrating, but that was cool. There was another kind of DIY punk venue called the pit. And this was just in a greasy warehouse district, you know, kind of underground thing or whatever, but we played a lot of cool shows there. I remember we had played, there was a, uh, you remember the Swedish band Raised Fist? They're kind of like a hardcore. Yeah, they had played that venue, and it was just you had like people like holding up the monitors and you know, just crazy circle pits. But yeah, that, that was super cool. You know, often the, the venue didn't have you know heat and stuff, so you're just freezing cold. You know, playing shows there, but they were the best at the times. They were the blurst at times. What was the first show you ever played? And was it with um, Mary? The- the, the first show we ever played would have pr- not including like our high school talent show, which would have been, you know, that would have been at that, um, uh, that jazz basement. And that would be like 20, 1999, some, somewhere along those lines. But uh, we played a, 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 again, a cool venue called, it was called the wash and slosh. And it's kind of a biker run bar on this, this cool Broadway. It's kind of the best place in Saskatoon. And, uh, yeah, so you could you could wash your clothes and see a band or whatever, but it was just a greasy again, like lots of cool bands played there, like Cryptopsy and you, you name it, all the kind of you know real cool, cool uh, metal bands played there. But uh, yeah, that would have been our first show, and I probably to like ten people maybe, and half of them would have been our buddies. And you guys what? So during that punk period for the band, you guys put out um, a full length, right? Uh, what repetitive disorder and an EP titled raise, raise your head in 2003. Yeah, that's correct. And again, that was just kind of DIY stuff, you know, burning, burning the CDs and get, getting buddies from high school to make the artwork type of stuff. But it was, it was our first, you know, experience of, of putting out music and doing the recording. And I, that was really cool. You know, the first time you get into a studio and you're recording that, that felt like another one of those, not that, not that you made it, but you kind of feel, you're like, I feel like an artist or I feel like a musician. And I just, it was a real special moment for me. And not that the stuff is that great, but you know, it was just the first step of many. Well, I wonder if you have a, you're going to put it on like a box set or something with the, with the, cause obviously the band has changed, which we'll talk yeah. about too. Yeah. Have like once, thought- in, once in a blue moon, we'll have someone contact me and they're like, Oh, I'm a big fan. Or even we were at, we were at a show uh, um, last year. And this guy came up and started singing lyrics to one of the songs. I'm like, man, I didn't think anyone in the world thought about that for like the last 20 years. So it was, it was crazy. I don't, it's kind of a little too weeny, like to match up with the new band, but I, I, I still like it for what it is. And so you guys, but what decided to pretty much call it quits for a while. What's that? Did you and Mary go to university during that time period? Yeah, we went to university, but before that, we kind of we were work, me and Murray were working in bars, and we we were kind of just being deadbeats, you know, that the classic, you know, we would finish our shift and then crush a bunch of beers. And I think Matt, the other guitarist, was seeing that you know we weren't going anywhere, didn't. So he he kind of jumped ship, and then me and Murray spent many years trying to rebuild, you know. We were, we were going to call it mega spite, you know, just like we were, you know, uh, uh, inspired by like, you know, oh, you think we can't do this, so we're going to do it type of thing. And we had had lots of, you know, drummers that we would bring in and they kind of sucked or whatever. So we never really got it going. And then eventually, I think it was, I want to say 2006, this was after or maybe during our uh, university, we got together with a guy. Uh, it was just A and B sound. He had one of those, you know, little like uh, ads, you know, where you rip off the numbers. And he said, you know, 19 year old drummer looking to play punk rock. And Is that Chris or Douglas? Metal. or? And that was Scott Cross. And from okay, there, that's when we officially started the metal band. And it was it was uh, the goal. It was going to, you know, trying to sound like rust and peace at, mixed with, you know, like a little bit of like death or children of Bodom kind of thing. Did you guys did a you guys did a two song EP prior to that though? Did you guys with Chris Douglas on drums and you guys were handing out? Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, that was and again those for whatever reason in our mind and this might have been uh, uh, Matt Haynes, the other guitarist. You know, we wanted to write really long songs, so they were like a couple, like six and a half and eight minute songs, and it was just because you know we wanted to get out of the punk phase where you know writing two minute songs you know was punk. So you know to be metal, we needed to write eight minute songs and. Th- those are good songs, but again, like if I were to go back, I would arrange those songs both to be, you know, three and a half, four minute songs and just all killer, no filler. 
So you guys did the two song and what? So you guys decided to basically, hey, we're going to, were you guys trying to find different names at first and said, hey, you know, let's go back to the un, untimely demise name? Yeah, yeah. We had a few, I think, conviction for a bit, but just not, all of them kind of sucked or whatever. And we're just like, you know what? Let's just do untimely demise. It makes sense. It, you know, yeah, it, it, we just landed on it. It was kind of a case of we, we liked it enough to, to keep going with it. And when you guys did that two song EP, you guys at first were trying to get what you were gave it to a promoter from a Amigos Cantina. Yeah, that got that got you guys. So that was like a big move for you guys because that kind of got that's you guys. Impressive. How did you know that? Or uh, just was just doing some stuff reading on you guys. I, you know, the history of the band. I and told stuff you. And, I told you he was going to get you. Man, that's inf- like, geez. Yeah, basically, we uh, sent him the songs or whatever, the promoter for Amigos, which was like kind of. That was the venue that we want it to play. That's what we want it to aspire to play. And he's, uh, we're like, oh, can we be on the three inches of blood bill or whatever? And it was a Monday night show. And he's like, sorry, man, bill's full. And we're, we sent him the songs. We're like, just listen to them. And then like a half a minute later, he's like, all right, you can open up uh, a half an hour set and I'll give you a hundred bucks and a bar tab or something. We're like, fuck, sweet. And I remember getting there and it was a Monday night show. And for whatever reason, it was freaking full the other, our other guitarist has like anxiety issues and, and, you know, there's like 300 people in the bar and, and we've got like cam pipes from three inches of blood checking out his mics behind us. And we're just, again, just little goobers. And I, I remember just the, the anxiety, but it was such a cool moment. We played the great show and, you know, the band after us, how about Untimely Demise? And again, it was that one of those things where when you heard that cra- crowd roar, you're like, oh man, that is addictive and, and awesome. That was another win. And was, was that done with Scott Cross also, that show? Yeah, that was Scott Cross. Scott Cross was in the band for quite some time. Like, he recorded that, that two-song demo with us. We did Full Speed Metal, Full the speed EP. Metal. And he did City of Steel and um, Systematic Eradication. Yeah, so he did three professional releases with us. And were you guys, like, what was the rehearsals like back then when you guys were getting ready? To, when you could, So we're going to the, like, the Full Speed Metal EP. Like when you guys were preparing for that, were you guys doing a couple times a week? Like how serious was you oh, guys taking all, it? Like all the time, three at least three times a week. If we didn't jam three times a week, we felt that was like a, a not a success for the week. You know, it was that classic early on. And we jammed out like Scott Cross lives about a half an hour out of town in this uh, just a little farm. And he has this big Quonset or whatever, just super cool. But yeah, me and Murray would drive from Saskatoon, usually like have a beer on the drive, you know, to the uh the practice you know pumping creator or sodom and and that's what i would always do is we would play like some sort of you know heavy music that we're inspired by and then i would just like copy the rhythms as my warm-up uh when we would start jamming with scott when we got there and you know scott would put a beat to it and a a lot of cool songs were written that way you know by ripping off a, a sodom you know guitar chop or something and then just turning it into our own thing but yeah just tons and tons of jamming where we would jam there crush beers you know he, he scott's you know classic farm boy so there's dirt bikes and sh- shotguns and all that type of stuff just everything you would expect from a, a hick from saskatchewan and who who actually did you guys logo for you guys designed it like um the the, the one on letter. the uh, full speed metal the, EP? The, the, the logo itself, like the Untimely Demise, that was a guy from Toronto. I don't recall his name off the top of my head, but yeah, it's. I think it was like 75 bucks. It was probably like the most economical money we've ever spent <laughs> in our band. Yeah, and then, bad, yeah, yeah, we've always just went with Ed Rapka for the, the artwork. It's up to this point. It's kind of just, it's a thing. It, you, you put all the effort into making the um, the albums. It's nice to have the really cool artwork, too. Yeah, you guys have always worked with him. You also recorded at uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn Drover Studio in Toronto. How did that whole relationship get started? So, again, Mur- like Murray's the king. I, I'm, I've kind of grown into it, but Murray was always the king of the connections and make you know building the, the bridges or whatever. So he had got in contact with Glenn right after he uh, quit Magadeth. And, yeah, we kind of got, got it in touch with each other he's like well you know i'm in toronto because we wanted to, him to record us and we're like yeah we'll we'll, we'll come out and yeah we just did a, a four song ep and this was when matt haynes the guy that was in the, the guitar player in the punk band he had came back and actually played on the full speed metal album but again 
when we started wanting to record in Toronto and do these things, that's when he started pushing back and he's like, Oh, I don't have time for this. So I remember I'd, I actually paid for Matt to fly out and record his solos. Like we didn't need him to do his, um, like rhythms or anything. But at the time I just, I didn't know that Glenn was going to be so willing to just put solos on. I was going to ask you about that. That's awesome. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, we brought Matt out and he did his solos, but, um, yeah, and then he, with the idea he wasn't planning on sticking with the band, he, he was just going to do that. That was going to kind of be his swan song or whatever. So we did that. Then we ended up putting out Full Speed Metal, got another guitar player who also ended up being in Raven Witch. Is that Noel Wilcox? Yeah, yeah. And he's just a fan. Like, he's a genius when it comes to guitar. Like, again, all these guys are, are so much further ahead than me when it comes to that kind of lead playing. But yeah, he came in and did a year or whatever. And, th- and that was good. But again, I-, I think me and Murray were just so motivated to want to do stuff that that pushed a lot of people away because, you know, yeah, you're asking people to jam and take time off work and this and that. And, and, and people some generally hobby. Hate, hate that shit. Yeah. We're actually going to play, we're going to play full speed metal off of the full speed metal EP that came out, uh, what, May 2009, you recorded that with, with Glenn, uh, November of that year. We're going to yep. play that. We'll be back on the Tampa Morgue right after this track from Untimely awesome. Demise. And that was Full Speed Metal off the Untimely Demise EP from 2009. So 2009, you guys actually toured through Canada on that one also, on that EP? 
Yeah, we did. I think, yeah, we went out to, we went out west. So we went all the way to Vancouver. And again, that was, that was a cool, like, I think that was our first official kind of tour, I, I would say. We went with a band called Evil Survives. And they were like um, Iron Maiden worship type of band or whatever. And they were just fantastic, like such a hot band. They had two lead guitarists and this the piercing high, you know, Halford type vocals. And and they had the look and everything too. And I think they were also, they also had Ed Repka artwork. So we had that connection. Um, but yeah, went out with them and that was cool. You know, like some of the shows were, were decently attended. Others were, I, there was one that we didn't even play because it was like, in, in between Calgary and Vancouver, it was just, uh, I think, I forget, might have been Chilliwack or something like that. And it was like a house show, which I like, we're not too good for anything like that. But start bringing it in and, you know, there's the three meth heads sleeping in the basement. And you're like, <laughs> I don't feel comfortable bringing in a DW kit and all this stuff. And we're like, so we just ended up not playing that show and going right to Vancouver. And yeah, Vancouver was the last last show. And that we played uh, the rickshaw there, which was cool because we've, since played shows with ed you know uh, you when did when was that that would have been 2012 that was the death to all yeah that was 14 we we played um we played the rickshaw there yeah that's a kind of greasy venue in a greasy part of vancouver but man a lot of cool bands have played there it's like an old theater or something that's what it looked like yeah it was, yeah it was it, the showers were in the basement and it was just a weird i mean they were disgusting but if you want to shower i guess yeah take a shower and disgusting yeah it was fun though yeah. it was a good show i remember it i remember all the shows we played in canada were because you were on most of those right yeah all of the all of the west coast ones anyway i know we did vancouver calgary winnipeg and and regina Yep. Yep. Yeah. So they're there and all the Canada, I think we only played one other show after that in Canada and they were all, but I just were remember. All killer. Yeah. The, the Winnipeg show. And that was at I believe that was at the park theater. The one I was talking about at the start of the, uh, and that was cool. Cause man, your sound for Winnipeg is just perfect. Like that, you know, heavy, no fucking frills, no bullshit, just like death metal. I, I just remember seeing the crowd when, when Massacre was playing. I was like, man, this is fucking nuts. Like, it reminded me of watching, you know, VHSs from the 80s, you know, crowds like that where just just madness. Yeah, it's funny you said that because I remember watching Obituary that night. And they were so fucking – I mean, they're heavy every night. Yeah. But there were certain venues that the sound that, – that sound, their sound yeah, just carries and – Man, that night you could bring that up. It it was fucking heavy because it was the backstage area wasn't very big, so you oh, know, oh not, no, not compared to most venues. And so you kind of wandered around, you know, yeah. most of the night because you didn't really have anywhere to hang out. And I remember watching them and was just like, holy fuck, they are so heavy. So yeah, I guess it was a, it was a good yeah. All those shows in Canada were great, but that, I remember that show was yeah. I remember it's that one chart. just sounding and looking so cool. And again, it, it, it's nice packed, you know, it, it was a good size. I don't know what it was at the time. Like now it's, it's about 750, 800. I think back then they kind of had a wall in between the bar and the stage. So I think it was more of like, I want to say five or 600, which is kind of a perfect size for, for like that type of show, like massacre, obituary, death to all type of stuff in Canada anyways. And that that EP you guys put out, that guy's what? That got you attention from uh, Sonic Onion. Yeah, and and it was also put out on a, uh, I want to say War on Music. That was a Winnipeg label, and they did a 500 run of that as well. But yeah, it was. Yeah, it got attention with Sonic. I think City of Steel might have been the one that really got Sonic Onion, and that was cool too because um, uh, Sask Arts Board gave us like a $10,000 check to make that out. And it wasn't like a, a bursary or something that, or some, it wasn't like something where you had to pay it back. It was just like, we got a check. It said on time. That was the mind. grant, right? So, yeah. And it was $10,000. And it was like that Wayne's world, like got but thousand dollars. And, you know, it just, again, felt so cool. And the, and we did that city of steel with, um, with Glenn again, and got Ed to do the art. And that's when Sean Palmerston from Sonic onion, he was the kind of media guy got in contact with us and then that's where we got onto sonic onion and 
it's unfortunate that it was at the tail end of kind of like the music industry with like physical sales because you know it was cool getting to see like our album in like the hmvs and stuff but it was still kind of right at that end of you know when cds were selling you know your album covers you talked about repka how did you first get involved with him did you contact him yourself or did you go through a a friend or something yeah that was 100 percent murray just doing a cold call nice yeah like yeah, you, nine times out of 10, when it comes to us, it's like, how did you make that connection? It's like, that's my brother. That, that was Murray doing it again, just you making calls. And, you know, back in the day, whether it was like my space or, or whatever, you would just make connections. And then that, it was like the, the new era of tape trading and letter writing and stuff. How do you do it with Repka? Do you like give him your ideas or do you like kind of draw them up like a, an idea or just kind of give him a yeah, couple basic, songs? Yeah, bass, he likes the the song lyrics. So, you know, like for like the type of song that he's going to be inspired by, giving him the lyrics for that usually helps. You know, the, the last album with Maverick, you know, we specifically had like our a 16-year-old, you know, childhood car was a Ford Maverick, that same color, that gold color. And Murray had ended up flipping it. And then we cut the roof off with like a jigsaw and uh turned it into a convertible with like no window and stuff or whatever so we just had this cool like you know uh connection to that car so we wanted that specific car on on the the cover but that was about it from our input and what was and with the uh so you guys like you said you went into you did seven tracks at eclipse studios in toronto with glenn and well the idea for the city of the art of city of steel artwork was that was that like a concept you guys had really thought of it's pretty cool cover man there's a lot of yeah like uh, both Murray and I, but especially Murray, like he studied in university, you know, like World War history and all that. So it's just a, a huge passion for him. I like it. Both of our grandparents fought in the war and stuff. So we're just, it's a, a cool topic and, you know, it just fits the heavy metal. It fits our name. And yeah, just the cool, the old, the old Russian and German, you know, soldiers fighting to the death on a pile of corpses. It's like, it's perfect. And does Murray handle all the lyrics for the band? Yeah, like once in a blue moon, if there's a bunch of songs that don't have lyrics, I'll I'll do a you know a song on an album or whatever. But he's he's way better at that shit than me. I'm I'm just I kind of focus on the music and and we do our division of labor. You know, he he's got the good lyrics. I'll I'll you know maybe say how I I would like to phrase it or you know like put more or less words here. But in general, Murray writes the lyrics. And what well, so that and that album got nominated for what you got a uh, Canadian Independent Music Award off uh, Sirius XM for Group of the Year 2012. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. We got flown to like Toronto to this like Royal York Hotel, and it was like a, a bunch of sandwich head, you know, idiots, like just the worst scene ever. I, I at that moment realized I never want anything to do with that bullshit, and you know, like the kind of real music and or real music industry peoples and stuff. I just I hated all that shit. You know, we, we went there, we were kind of treated like second class because we're metal heads or whatever, you know, no one gave us the time of day. You know, we wanted to get a beer and, you know, uh, it's like, you got to wait in that line or whatever. And we're like, man, we're nominated for award. And all these other, and we're backstage. All these other guys have beers. And I remember this one pretentious guy's like, well, just wait 20 years or something. Then maybe you can have a, just like some real <laughs> I was like, fuck you guys, man. Like, so yeah, from that moment, I was like, I never want to do any like award shows or put any, any of my effort into that ever again. And now it's just real things, you know, real fans talking to people at merch tables, playing real shows, doing, doing the actual stuff, not getting glamored by, you know, I, at the time, you know, we were going to like industry groups, you know, for like management and, you know, we go into like, uh, rooms that looked like the entourage, you know, like big long tables with like Chad Kruger's face and like people from <laughs> Twilight up and, you know, they're kind of glamoring us and it just like it, that that's not, there's no room for that in underground heavy metal and thrash. It's just, they're two different scenes and yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Figured that out quickly. I agree with that. Um, and so and we talked about obviously 2012, the shows with massacre in Edmonton and Calgary. How did you get in work with uh, Eric Reif? Ah, that one, I think, I forget how it was. I don't know if he contacted us or, or vice versa, but I think he had heard something. It might've even been virtue and death or something like that. He heard the song and he's like, why aren't we working together? And then 
that's kind of, I think, led to that birthday bash show, which is what really kind of started the whole connection with with uh, Massacre, with Eric, you know, getting to do our European tour, getting to open up for these guys for that uh, Death to All tour. And yeah, it just, it led to a lot of great stuff. You guys, did you guys come into, so, um, did you guys do any American shows in 2012? Because didn't, was it Mary that had trouble getting into the border? Yeah, the issue was, yeah, we had a nice tour booked which was just awesome you know we were going to kind of do that classic triangle where you go down the west coast and then we would have just worked our way back up you know to you know western canada and um we made it played a killer show in vancouver you know one of those great shows you sell tons of merch you're like oh man this is great and we're going through the border and then they asked like about how much merch we had or whatever. And I forget the number I said, I was like 500 bucks or something or a thousand. And they're like, Oh, you got to go through the commercial crossing or whatever. So then we had to go through the commercial crossing, you know, go through all the x-ray machines. And at that point they had pulled Murray aside. They're like, Hey, so you had some trouble uh, with the law. Like, you know, Murray had a an, an break in incident at that time. It was already two decades old, you know, or like, 18 years old he had been pardoned for it it was like but i guess his waiver had expired or something so yeah again we were on the phone with eric trying to see if there was anything we could do and ultimately there wasn't so it was kind of we had to turn the tour around you know just listening to sad songs on the way back and it was annoying too because you know on our phones every night for the next two weeks we're getting reminders you've got a show coming up in an hour like shut up like come on but yeah that was if anything, that would probably be the biggest disappointment, you know, with everything, but everything happens for, you know, who knows what would have happened or whatever you like. It's just, there's nothing you can do about it, but yeah, that was pretty unfortunate. So we've never played the States and and we've tried to, to regroup and do it, but man, with all the red tape and your, your P2 visas and stuff to do it, to do it uh, without trying to do it under the radar, it's man, it's pretty hard to, to do that if you don't have, like, if you're not rich, I guess. Is that what kind of caused you guys to part with uh, Sonic Onion? Well, yeah, they were kind of, our, yeah, they were kind of, that, I think that was a that was a big thing for sure. That would have, they're like, oh, they can't play the States. We can't break the States. They they want it kind of probably nothing to do with us. I'm assuming, I, I, I can't speak for them, but. That was, and I think also Scott Cross or the drummer leaving, that would have been uh, one for him too, where he just was like, oh, that was disappointing. I, he didn't really know anything about Murray's thing. So that really caught him off guard and he was pretty upset about that. But uh, yeah, then it was a rebuilding where like me and Murray went back to j- just uh, j- our jam space in our parents' uh, basement. And we were like, we just play to like drum tracks, you know, through the PA for for quite a few years until we ended up getting our next drummer or whatever. But yeah, that was one of those, again, where you, you, you question, do we keep going? And then you're like, man, I just like this so much. How I, I just couldn't imagine not doing it. Couldn't you guys go to parliament and get, and get that squared away. Cause I know like going into Canada on the DTA tour, Trevor, yeah, they, they weren't going to let him in. Uh, he had something from way back and there was a deal where he had to pay like 400 bucks and he was able to get into Canada for this tour. But after that, he would have to go to parliament okay. and get it, get it rectified through Canada. Other, cause there was no more, like no more $400 and you yeah. could come in. It yeah. was over. So yeah. I'm just wondering why Murray couldn't go get that fixed. Yeah, cause was he's it got, coming into he's, America or was yeah. it? It was, co- going, it, it was going into America and yeah, he's got the part like a permanent pardon. Like none of that is on his record, but I guess, um, you, you still need a waiver to get, you can be pardoned from all of your criminal past, but you still need to purchase a waiver. It's just another you know, bullshit. It expires you know? and stuff too. And then I, think. I think he had like a five year one and it expired, you know, like the month uh, before or something, which again, he probably should have been on, but on top of that, but wasn't and it. But yeah, I mean, like, so like all, all it is, is he just needs to pay for another waiver. Like it's not an issue now, but it, again, it's just another one of those things where it just, you don't always have that fricking thousand dollars to, to scrap, to grab. It's a cash grab. Now, if yeah. you're getting on a tour where you're going to play 30 days in America, it's worth it. Cause you'll recoup your money. But yeah, for a small run, I guess it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is like, we're kind of at that level where we're, we're just below the like mid-level band, you know, where like, 
you, you can get on the bills and play cool stuff, but you can never really command enough of the guarantee to to offset the money that you put into it, which again, like I'm always fine with like taking losses on tours. Cause to me, like experiences are that that's wealth to me, you know, uh, uh, that our tour in Europe, you know, like I wouldn't trade that for the world. And I, I know a lot of, a lot of bands and a lot of people would, would, well, people do do pay to play type stuff, you know, where they would pay money to, to be on a tour like that. Yeah. You that guys- would, the, the European thing was a different beast. I mean, and then of course our, our day and a half in Amsterdam. I'm sure Murray Murray remembers that one pretty well. Oh. I remember that. I remember Murray on that day. Man, yeah. Uh, do you remember that we'll bar that was super one. cool? With he had the, like the symbols on, along the whole bar or whatever. And like, the motorcycle right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, man, that was that a was sick cool. bar. But we actually crushed a few beers. I remember ma- waking up the next day and like our phones were out of like uh, bat juice, and we thought like we had woken up like way too late. You maybe like you guys had even left without us. And then we got upstairs like, Oh, okay. We're still, it's still good. But yeah, I, I feel like we were kind of uh, maybe a little bit, uh, cause uh, our guitars and merch didn't show up that night, like with, with us on that tour. So we we're like, Oh man, what are we going to do? Luckily the next day we were able to, to get them, but that was our well, first remember ex- Mike, our drummer, Mike, That's remember his right. stuff never showed up. His stuff never showed up. So we, but, but do you remember? And- in yeah, man. Uh, Belgium, uh, after we played our last show, remember there was a stack up. of symbols or whatever. It showed the, the, up. The, the, the suitcase with all his drum shit showed yeah. up. I'm like, yeah. you fucking pricks. Now we got to pay to send it back to yeah. America. I know. <laughs> and we, we, if you remember when we played England, it cost it, it cost um, almost a hundred bucks for US to rent pedals for Mike because he could, he said he couldn't play he couldn't play a. a like a, a double pedal. So he had to have double bass pedals and it was almost, it was like whatever in Europe pounds. Wow. It was like 70 pounds, 80 pounds, whatever yeah. that it wound up being almost 90 bucks, 80 bucks American for a fucking set of pedals for one show. That is, imagine. I mean, that's insane, that crazy. But, but that's what happens, man. When the airlines fuck you. Yeah. That was a cool show though. I, I remember that venue was called the bar fly that was in London and that was a cool kind of upstairs bar. And again, that was nice and packed so it's it's cool having you know a massacre sound in a venue like that is just you know kind of a plus the uh the what you call it the uh uh, what do they call those things the barge over get driving the van on the barge and then we the ferry barge from yeah yeah, the ferry over that was like that was uh, that was my first experience and i was like holy shit and then i just did it again when we went to europe uh last year and i was like all right and I, I know what this is now, but was that the, the was first it, time you're like fucking Godzilla's or, yeah. or, you know, war, yeah. war, the world's the fucking aliens are going to come oh, yeah. out from the bottom of the fucking water. And was, was that still that, uh, from Calais to Dover, like the same area or did you take, do you know, we went, we went back to, um, pretty much almost the same area. We played, um, just outside of London. I guess it would be. Oh man! Um, and that was that. That's with the monstrosity, or who was? That's that? with monstrosity. Yeah, we did that tour with Origin. Nice. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was because at least with that show, we did two or three shows over there in in England. We only did one. We took that whole freaking ferry for one show. That was kind of stupid. Yeah. But that's well, how it works sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we did Leeds as well too. Remember? Yeah, there was Leeds and uh, and London. Because yeah, you did what? Kill uh, the Kin Hellfest? Yeah. Leeds? Yeah. On Tommy Demise? Uh, yeah, I guess we. Um, I think. Did we do that Death yeah. Festival? I thought yeah, that was the one. Yeah, because basically what happened is you guys did Neurotic Death Fest. That mm-hmm. was in what? Yeah, Netherlands or whatever. Yep. I remember that was uh, the one funny thing from that because you guys had your, your 30 second sample, you know, like the start of Back from Beyond or whatever. Mm-hmm. You got it on an MP3 that just needed to be like unplugged and you're like yep. before the sh- And it set, kept playing. You- it kept playing through the first song. But yeah, you got you got Murray to like unplug or you wanted him. Yeah. To, and I just remember like that being a lot of anxiety because you got this whole venue and you got this cool band asking you to do this thing. And yeah. Yeah, that, that was fun. But yeah, so we did that. Then I think there was a day off for something before the Kin Hell Fest. We ended up showing up early and we were like sleeping in the van that first night because we didn't didn't have a hotel. And I, there was like some sort of thing happening in Leeds where all the hotels were booked. Or yeah, well, actually, we played we played with. Um, oh, God, what the hell was that band? I used to listen. Onslaught was the headlining band that night. And I remember 
Rick was laying in the van, like in the backpack. Yeah. I was in between two things, like laying on a hump and we couldn't go in. And I think it was, it might've been Murray. Murray and Terry were inside the club sleeping on the floor. Yeah. Terry was sleeping in a chair. Yeah. If you can imagine Terry Butler yeah. sleeping in a chair with his feet up on another chair. It was because there was no hotels, nothing. Yeah. And it was cold. Who was the other band with you guys? Lay Down Rotten, they were called? Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're a good heavy German band. Mm-hmm. Kind of just, again, just heavy, heavy music. You yeah, know? they did. I think they did. They didn't do the whole tour. They did like the shows in Germany and around we did England it was just us yeah and uh and then the last show they didn't play because we had morphed it with pestilence that's right yeah. and uh I remember that show I've heard that well. story before yeah I'm not telling it I'm not <laughs> yeah, telling I remember it. that I've heard that story so and, and what so you guys also though when you guys ended for like well it didn't end but when you guys got off of uh, Sonic Onion you guys hooked up with what the Italy label uh Punishment 18 Records in 2013 yep yeah. yeah that's right they put out I want to say two of our albums and and I think with Systematic when they put that one out they had also like subbed it out to some American label. I, I want to say it's called End of Light or something and and they did a little run of that as well. But yeah, they were good again. Um I don't know why we stopped working with it was kind of a case of just like it got to the point where just doing it ourselves kind of made the most sense for us, you know, cuz then you at least get some money out of what you're selling, you know, each physical CD. And again, like times are different now, but back then me and Murray like really prided ourselves on like making, making a go of it, doing this little band thing. So, you know, we just lived very, you know, very uh, frugally and, uh, and uh, had to make choices that we had to do. So yeah, like we worked with them, with uh yeah the italian label for a couple but i they think had they good were just, distro i think didn't they in europe yeah they, they yeah they had good distro but just ultimately i it, you know you have to always make choices and it was one of those things where we we're just like uh i think uh when we did i don't know if it was no promise of tomorrow or maybe i think it might have been black widow or something but yeah we just decided to put it out on our own and and it worked it worked out well for us well, and you mentioned a systematic eradication. You guys were driving out to what Mississauga for that one to record that. Yeah, yeah. So that one, yeah, we didn't even fly. So that's like a good over thirty hours each way to drive for that. Wow. But and uh, Brad- yeah, me, me and Murray had we just had a little Chevy Cobalt. You know, no AC. It's you know plus however many degrees driving there. You're just we would just pull over to the side of the road and sleep. You know. It, it is a crazy time where you're just a hundred percent all in. And, you know, at that point, you know, neither of us, we were both single dudes and stuff. So you could just literally, you could just live wherever you want it and kind of be a nomad and, and make those decisions. Now, now it would be a little different, you know, to justify drive spending, you know, five or six days driving to record somewhere. But back then it, it, it made sense. And that's what, is that when Scott Cross left was limited to during that recording? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was the last one he did. So again, yeah, it was kind of similar to like when Matt Haynes with Full Speed Metal, he came and did the album, but knowing that he was already going to be out of the band and he, we had agreed that he didn't want to play anymore. And that's and, where and right, Corey there, Thomas comes in, right? That you guys were talking about earlier. Yeah. So he, yeah, Corey kind of is like at this point, the go-to promoter in Winnipeg, you know, any, any of the big shows, Corey Thomas is going to be, he, he's the talent buyer for Park Theater and we at the time he was just you know kind of another guy in a band and you know he was putting on shows but we liked him uh, we asked him if he wanted to play in the band and he was a uh, part-time you know banker at the time so the first set we played with him he learned how to play our music just drumming on his like um his bank be- desk you know we did like a jam before playing the show and that was kind of it but but that that was the start of it's not like Untimely Demise has pickup bands, but we've gotten to the point where we can just, you know, find people that are. You guys talented. picked up San Martz also that time period. Yeah, yeah, he Star came player. in, and and that was really cool because we had been a three piece for a long time. I think even probably all the time. To- I'm gonna say mo- most of the stuff. Or no, we, Sam did the the European tour with us, but when we did the Chuck Birthday Bash, we were just a three piece at the time, and we did a That's lot. That's what of- blew me away. Because you guys were a three piece, and I was like, "This doesn't exist." You know what I mean? To like be able to play, because 
usually, you know, when you break into leads, you got that the rhythm. But yeah. Murray was holding the rhythm down on the bass the way you're supposed to. And I was like, all right, that's how it's supposed to be done. You know, yeah. my corner, like when corner would play as a three, cause they were a three piece yeah. forever. Yeah. Right? They still are. I think, um, just, you know, doing it right. Yeah. You guys were, yeah, but Sam, Sam shredded and so did Corey, man. That's why like when we did the European tour, I was like, Holy shit. You know, you guys stepped up with, uh, getting these people cause you didn't have them before. And we were like, man, all right, now it's a different sound for the band. So it was even better. That was cool, but it's it's funny because Corey's like a kind of through and through. He's a grind drummer. He likes those, you know, 220 plus kind of blast beats. So when he came into Untimely Demise, we're kind of, you know, more like thrash. So again, would prefer the 180, 190 beats a minute. But when I listen to some of the live stuff from that tour, we're playing at two. We're trying to keep up to you guys, clearly, <laughs> it seems like. Yeah, you know, and you yeah. mentioned, so with that album, with the Systematic um, Eradication album, so you guys composed it like classical music, right? When you guys wrote those, when you guys were putting the songs together and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, How much did Glenn have to do? Like, what kind of influence did he have on you and Mary from working with him so much? I would say the biggest things uh, with um, with Glenn that he's taught me um, is just feeling it. So, like on our earlier albums, you know, we would have long instrumental breaks. And, you know, Glenn kind of introduced me like, oh, man, that sounds thin. Let's put in a lead melody there. Let's put in a, a solo there. And, and you know, how how like Megadeth would do it, where you just fill it up with tons of leads and stuff. So that would be a, a huge uh, thing. And then just even the way that I write my leads and stuff, I feel like Glenn helped me where I would just, you know, do more shredding, tons of notes. And he would be like, man, like sometimes you just got to you got to let a note ring or, you know, when you finish your your solo don't end on that perfect uh, classical cadence hit on the ugly sounding one and, and give it some vibrato. So I would say those would be some of the big things that, uh, that Glenn brought as far as like the song arrangements. Generally I have them a hundred percent arranged. I'll even write out the, the sheet music and I'll, I'll, I'll record the demos and have all the tempos mapped up just cause that's just the process I've always did. Cause I've I was going to ask you, like, what is the writing process for you guys? That's what I was going to ask you, actually, too. Yeah, so basically, uh, at this point, yeah, it's just uh, I'll write the riffs or whatever, arrange them, and then I like kind of coming up with, you know, about three good riffs and then doing some variations on them throughout. So you maybe you'll make riff one, you'll take a part of that, make it the tail of riff two or whatever, and kind of mix and match. And then, and then as far as we'll either do like a verse course type, you know, structure, or also like doing like, you know, in Megadeth, like uh, Rust in Peace, you know, something like Polaris, like track nine, where it's almost like a part one and part two, so, like, mm -hmm. and you put them together. I like doing, you know, songs like that. But yeah, just writing cool riffs. And I know one thing that Tim from Into Eternity has always turned me on is like, he says, if you don't have a course, you don't have a song. So I always like to make sure you, you kind of have a course, you know, before you have the song. It's nice because then you're going to have a tangible song. I've had so many songs back in the day where I've got killer riffs in all of them, but um, you don't have a good chorus and then it never becomes a, a song that, you know, cat catches on. And you mentioned Tim from Into Eternity. I know he's also played on a few of your records, um, but how did, so 2014 is when you started playing with them? With Into Eternity? Yeah, Into Eternity. Yeah. So uh, we were putting out Systematic Eradication. We had two uh, CD release show or album release shows. And um, one was Saskatoon, one was Winnipeg. And a week before, we got a call from Into Eternity saying they couldn't, they, they were going to be on the bill. It was untimely Into. And uh, basically, t uh, they said, yeah, we can't do these shows, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Justin was going to be leaving the band. He's the other guitar player in Into. And then a week later, I got a call from Tim saying, hey, do you want to join Into Eternity? And that's kind of how it started because it's about a year before that Stu block had left into eternity to go into iced earth. So that uh, we had Amanda Kiernan in, in, um, into eternity at the time. And she's a fantastic vocalist and a great front person or whatever. So jo joining the band at the time, it was, it was just so cool because yeah, it was just a bunch of nice people again. That that's kind of my vibe. I like, I like hanging with nice people and I don't like working with warped assholes cause ain't nobody got time for that. Definitely. How was what? What was your first show with Into Eternity? 
Um, we did a warm up in Regina, and then we did this kind of it was a, called Metal Wizard. It was like a festivaly kind of outdoor thing. It wasn't wasn't huge, you know, a few hundred people or whatever, but that was cool. And I, I remember for the the rehearse my first rehearsals that was you know kind of stressful because into is like fairly technical music there's a lot of you know odd time signatures and you're going from like untimely demise i was kind of i could be comfortable just playing on a distortion tone the whole time and you can kind of make it through your set with into you're going clean tones and then like a lead tone and then a rhythm and like so you're doing a lot of like footboard switching which was new to me and and just uh, learning how to play those songs. And I remember Stu Block it was there for the rehearsals. And when he walked in the first time, I, I remember feeling kind of starstruck, even though it's just, he's still a, just a guy from Regina. But, you know, at this point, he's in Iced, Iced Earth, which is a huge, you know, I, I've always loved Iced Earth, like that, all that type of, you know, the chops and stuff. I just love that type of music. But yeah, that, that was cool. P- play that show. And then, I don't know. I, I still just, I, I'm a guy. I freaking get nervous. I, I don't care how many hundred shows I play. I'll always get nervous before shows. And I don't think I've ever gotten over that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's fun. And I, I, my goal now when I play with any of the bands is just like making it look like I'm not hating life, you know, like <laughs> just, which is like for me harder than it looks, you know, just to, because I, I want to be my best, but now I understand sometimes you have to drop a few notes to kind of, you know, look a bit more engaging. And is, that, no, is that how Brian got involved with the band, Brian Newberry? Because I know he, yeah, what, was, he was with Into he, Eternity. Yeah, he was in Into Eternity, and we were playing Caligari Metal Fest. We tried a few drummers that we were going to get to fill in for that, because, again, Into was playing... Canada's very like when there's like a cool show, there's the bands that all jump on board type of thing. So we, Into was playing... Uh, untimely demise was playing and um yeah we had a, a drummer and we tr- did a, a jam with him murray and i and this guy just didn't have the double kicks which is fairly important for untimely demise so we were like hey brian can we just pay you to play this th- this set for us we paid him to play with untimely demise for caligari metal fest that was cool it was like into eternity cobra and the lotus and a bunch of other bands blah 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 and uh that went well and then from there he just kind of joined the band and we did um we did black widow with him and then when we heard what brian's drumming sounded like with our music we're like oh man it was cool that was a, a step up we we got to the next level with that which is super and black exciting. widow you guys you guys what so i, I think and i think jill and terry actually speaking of terry butler had something to do with this they kind of you guys did a crowdfunding right for that That's album and you guys set like a certain mark but you guys actually like raised more than you even thought for that record for black yeah Rose. yeah we raised over the amount that we wanted to and it, i think it was a really cool thing just because like it was kind of a little bit of a split where we had some people in saskatoon hating on us because you know they were equating us to being online you know uh panhandlers or whatever and we're like man all it was the most no frills you know kickstarter ever we were selling the album and a custom t-shirt limited to like you know, 60 t-shirts and we were charging way under charging, you know, like we, we could have, you know, sold way more to try and bring in more, but basically we were just pre-selling the album with a t-shirt and we, that's what we did, but we got a big backlash from the Saskatoon community saying that we were lazy and, you know, we're just panhandling and get basically get real jobs type of stuff. We're like, man, like I think there's always those haters that go along with that, no matter what. Yeah. It's, it's frustrating, but yeah, that, that worked out well for us. And it was cool that, yeah, that Terry and Jill were kind of able to give us, you know, some t- tips from what they had did. And um, yeah, it was a good experience. And ultimately it, it was good promotion for the album. And that was the first record that you didn't work with uh, Dover on, right? Because you got Dover, you guys went to, uh, who also played guitar into Eternity. You guys worked with uh, Justin Bender on that record, Black Widow? Yeah. So um, again, we'd got a grant from the Sask Arts Board for this album. And one of the stipulations was that it had to be recorded in uh, in Saskatchewan. And we didn't want to fly Glenn in and that, that was seeming like it was going to be expensive. So we're like, oh, we'll just try working with uh, with Justin. And I remember I, I was less skeptical. Murray was pretty skeptical. He's like, oh, we don't want the Saskatoon sound. You know, like th- we've had these good albums and like he felt it was going to be a step back. But ultimately it was it was better for us because i didn't have to hammer out vocals you know 
eight song vocal takes, you know, in one day or whatever, you know, two hours, like we were able to spend a little more time and that, that was fun. And, and it, it started the new, the new process of recording with, with Justin. And now, now I pretty much track everything but the drums. But on that record, you guys recorded at what, three different places, right? Because the drums were recorded in one place. I think, uh, well, Sean yeah. did his, Sean did something on in his own area because he did drums on track number nine for you guys on that album. Yeah. But, um, and also the guitar, your guitars and vocals were done at a different studio. So two, it was like three different studios, that record. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So basically the drums, we went to a place called Blue Door in Regina and uh, they, uh, because, you know, we wanted the good drum sound with a good room or whatever. But I think now I want to say, yeah, we I think we did vocals there as well for that album. But then the guitars, just to save a bit of money, I think we went and just did them in Justin's home studio. Just so then you're not paying for the producer plus the rental of the, you know, the facility. And you guys had uh, what, Sam Martz played on that album too. Justin played. It was Justin's a guitar player now with you guys, right? Uh, yes, but he's kind of just, he just leaving the band because, yeah, that it's, it's all the, the new saga of Untimely Demise. We always, we, we, uh, like the last two shows we played in Calgary and Edmonton, we had, uh, a new, another guy from, uh, Calgary that, uh, that's, or no, he's from Edmonton and he's playing the shows with us now. And that'll probably be the new lineup. He's, he's so one of his like, name? The, his name is Ty Lord Dory and he's like, uh, one of uh, Canada's just great shredders. Like, again, I like anybody I bring in the band, I want them to just be so much better than me. Cause it's like, man, like if, if they're not bringing something, what's the point, you know, like Ed said, we can do it as a three piece. If, if, you know, you're not getting something out of the deal, but, but, and again, like, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but with, cause uh, with Maverick, you know, that was all recorded during the COVID times. And I, I, I laid all that stuff down and it's a little bit more melodic. Cause I always like, I have that battle between, do I want it to be like just death metal or do I want to put in the Iron Maiden, Judas Priest stuff that I've, I, I just always love. And it's always going to be part of me. So we kind of pushed a little more into the Iron Maiden, Judas Priest for the Maverick album. But right now we've, we've got four songs and we're going to be doing an uh, EP. And th- these are just uh, going to be like, three and a half four minute bangers and less melody and kind of more of the going back to a little bit more of the death metal and that kind of faster tempo stuff so we're excited about that nice the black widow you guys did that you guys the day of the release you guys pretty much headed out on tour because you guys did what five shows uh with direct support for act act of defiance and you guys did some headlining shows in toronto and quebec and stuff yeah, and those were again. That was uh, all as a th- done as a three piece, and that that was pretty cool. Like all these tours, whether we're like trying to keep up with Massacre or Act of Defiance, the, the biggest thing is you guys have drivers, and we don't have the drivers. So you know, you play the shows, uh, then you, you have to drive, drive all night, and then you you usually have to do your warm or your sound check at like two or three. You haven't even slept, and then you know you get like one wink before you know you're playing your show. But man. Is it tough to keep up to those types of tours when it's not just like a your own independent tour? What's what's the best tour? What's your favorite tour you've done? And you don't have, I know Ed's sitting here, so we can like, <laughs> we'll, we'll oh, like up hands them. hands down. It was that that European tour. Like it's not like those are like the best shows I've ever played in my life. But that that tour was freaking cool. We had a driver, you know, like the, doing the heavy metal, like camping, you know, with the bunk beds and stuff, and just that taking the, the ferries and, and getting to see all these cool places. I know, uh, I forget, what was it? Uh, I want to say Allen, Germany or something. It was, it was a bar. Sh- or here, I just want to look at this book. What did you guys, did you guys like, do four shows like, in Germany? I want to say like Siegen or something like that. It was a, it was a bar show, but I just remember it, was, it being super packed. And again, just that was like, we had a cool response that, that night, you know, all the bands played cool. And I, I just, I, I would say that was, was such a, a special time. So yeah, I, I'm going to say that's probably my favorite tour as far as shows like untimely demise had did um, uh, a festival in Ham- just outside of Hamburg in 2019. That was with razor and Queens Reich was on that and blaze Bailey was on it. And, that was probably my favorite show just because it was like a big crowd and, and just, just fun, you know, one of those times where you play well and you sell merch and it's just good vibes all around. 
I remember like we, there was like meet and greets and I was like, man, nobody wants to see us. And like people had like photos of us and we're like, what, this is crazy. Like it just, That's it awesome. felt like one of those, like, you're like, oh man, they like me. They really like me moments. <laughs> and you, so, and too, so you guys put out that you guys did those tours. 2017, Brian leaves the band and you guys hook up with what, uh, James Burton from Endless Chaos out of Winnipeg? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a case where just, um, again, we... All of us are musicians and have our issues, but I, I think deal breakers for me and Murray is when you when you don't play show. Like if you've committed to a show, you gotta play it. Don't don't do the last minute back out because man, that it's so frustrating, especially if it's happened multiple times. Because then you got two options: you can look like a bozo and cancel, or you have to quickly, you know, find a new guy. And you know, it usually co- comes down to having to like drive to them and make sure that they're capable of doing it and just causes a lot of work. So it was one of those things where there was just a few show cancellations and then we're just like, we can't do this anymore. Started working with James and then uh, as life happens, you know, we all, we all grow up and get over things and, and uh, yeah, we put out no promise of tomorrow with James, which is a fantastic album. And just, I, I love, love, love that and loved working with James and would work with James in a heartbeat again. But uh, uh, Brian's back in the fold and, and, and we like it. And ultimately we've got a good chemistry. So it's just, sometimes you got to let things go and, and grow up a bit. And you mentioned that uh, we're actually going to play a track from uh, no promise of tomorrow in a minute. Um, but you mentioned that you guys start like when James comes in the band, did you guys start writing material right away for no promise uh, of tomorrow or did you already have like stuff already you had been working on prior? Yeah. I kind of feel like at the time I had a couple songs but I was just, then when we got James, then I just started, you know, amping it up. But I always like to kind of have a few songs socked away so it can build the momentum for the, the, the next album. And then, you know, sometimes you don't end up using those songs if you got enough. But it, I don't know. I'm just one of those guys. I like, it's, it's not like I get inspiration per se. I just, it's like part of my routine where I open up a session almost, you know, every day. And just write, you know, as part, like the same way you would practice running scales. I, I just always write. So then you just end up collecting them. So, yeah, I think I had a few demos, but nothing was was that well prepared. I, I think we even drove to Winnipeg uh, a couple times just to to work with James while we were writing them to to make it feel more like a band. And, and that was cool. And then ultimately, once we got all the demos, I, I had the slave tracks gave them to the producer that was working with James in Winnipeg and he laid down his drum tracks in Winnipeg, sent them back to us. And then, then we started taking over from there. Is that when Adam Sweeney started getting in the picture too for a while? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So again, Adam came through Brian, uh, Brian Newbery, because uh, he lived in Edmonton and we were playing shows and Brian's one of those guys, like if you need a guy, he's he'll always be like, hey, I got a guy, we should try him out. And and he always knows, like, it, they just have to be nice. Like, that's the only thing, you know, that really matters for us is, so yeah, we, he came to one of our jams, you know, we had some Pilsners and, you know, he's a good guy. And, and then he just was able to play the music and had, had the good look and all the stuff you want. So yeah, Adam came in and he was in the band right until uh, COVID. And then ultimately because of, not being able to, you know, vaccinations and this and that people, some people wanted to get them. Some people didn't. And ultimately uh, people left music because they weren't comfortable. They like Adam didn't want to play shows until everyone was allowed to, 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 you know, be at the show or whatever. So, and I res- like respect that and I have nothing but respect for that. But ultimately me and Murray still wanted to keep playing shows. So we, we got the vaccinations and, you know, kept going with it, but, you know, in, in hindsight, probably would have been nice to just take a few years off and then, you know, you know, pick back up where we left off. But, uh, you know, we, we did what we did and we played a few of those stupid shows where we had like, you know, partitions of plexiglass in front of us and stuff. But, uh, yeah, Adam was with us right up until, until the nonsense. And then I didn't see that ever. I never saw the plexiglass maneuver. That was, they were doing that. They were putting plexiglass in front of the stage. The thing is you, so you, uh, you get into the stage and they've got the plexiglass in front of you and then you hear your amps and it's just, it's basically like being in a tin box. So all you can hear is like symbol, like crash symbols and your guitar. And we're like, and you know, the audience, it's, it's just, 
kind of like uh, Roadhouse a bit, you know, uh, the movie Roadhouse. How they have, like, it was kind of like that or whatever. It's just stupid and and one of those things where you're like, yeah, this uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah, well, we're gonna play a song off. We're gonna play "Keep On Running," which is a killer track off of the uh, No Promise of Tomorrow record. And this one has a guest appearance on it, right? From uh, Bobby Kobel from Death, Death's All. Uh, he's on Incoming Pestilence, the next song. Next song on the record? Okay. How did you yeah. get involved? How did he get involved with the... That would have been from- a connection that uh, we made just through doing the Death to All shows. And then it just a- asked if he would want to do a, a lead on the, the song. Nice. We're going to play now. We're going to play Keep On Running uh, from No Promise of Tomorrow. Uh, from Untimely Demise, we'll be back on the Tampa Morgue right after this track. <laughs> untimely demise we keep on running from the no promise for tomorrow of tomorrow record um so 2018 you guys this year do your first record also with uh, into eternity yes yeah the sirens so again like the majority of that that's like the rhythms and stuff that's all handled by tim i just did you know some leads or whatever but yeah that, that was fun and I, again that it felt cool for me to to be on a, a different album that was that was that before I was on? Did the guest track "Lost"? What is it for you guys? Uh, "Lost." You did "Lost for Words" for us in 2020. Okay, so a year later. But yeah, that yeah. was kind of around that time where I was like, I, I, I wanted to say yes to everything. So any opportunity that came my way, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, that sounds cool." And I, I remember, yeah, that was that was so cool getting to hear my lead on your song. Like that was, yeah, like, man, we really awesome. appreciate that. Dude, oh, this killer. That was I was actually so listening cool. to it today, man. Yeah. You played on the insomniac death parade, which is the last record we actually put out. Um, and so, you know, we contacted you, 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 you banged that out right out too, man. You were, it was totally cool. We were glad I, I said to Ed, I said, man, do you think Matt would do a solo on the record? And Ed's like, dude, just, I'm pretty much saying he'll do it without saying he'll do it. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, uh, you got right back to us, man. So it was, I will, I will say this: I don't, I don't think Marco was very happy because uh, <laughs> he, he felt he felt the, he felt the threatening. So you know, <laughs> so what happened was is there was supposed to be a so he was supposed to do a solo on that song. Yeah, and he's just. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of like, when we're in the studio, man, we're, we're on the clock there, unfortunately. So we're like, and he just wasn't getting it done. And then I said, that's kind of where I said to Ed, I said, yep. let's ha- ask Matt to do it. And I remember when Marco did hear the solo, he's like, it's fucking good. But I could tell that he was like, you know, yeah. nobody yeah. wants anybody else eating their porridge. Jealousy, <laughs> baby. But yeah, yeah I just... Uh... The, the beauty for me is I can just record that and then be done with it. Where like you know when you're in the band, you have to you have to play all the you know it every night or whatever. Yeah. So you can make something as as di- tricky or as difficult as you want when you're in the studio. But then it's like the the proof is in the pudding when it, whenever you're playing it live, and that's generally what, where I have to relearn my solos and stuff when I'm playing them live. I'm like, oh man, what did I get myself into? But yeah, I remember just because that song it's so heavy and just got such a good groove and i was like i'm gonna put some melody in this like, that was I, awesome like, how, man I, yeah just like how can i get melody in this i'm like well oh, just just pick some scales and make it work but yeah i i'm pretty happy with that one still yeah no that's it we definitely appreciate that and you know also you actually were you sang on uh glenn, glenn drover's wall of bloods record right you actually on the uh, yeah. was imperium you actually did vocals on the title track well the the yeah. song walls of blood yeah. walls of blood yeah so that was really cool because for starters again just that uh that high school kid and me or whatever you know now you can say like i am on a record with someone that sang in front of judas priest or testament you know, like they had rip rowans and it's got queen's todd right you had todd latore on there todd too LaTour. like man just all these killer killer vocalists and then me <laughs> it's it's crazy yeah but that that she did that it was 2019 you also did guest vocals on a band, uh, animosity from calgary on one of their records nope nope that's i that's I don't believe so. That might yeah, be. So, I, no, I did just, a bunch of solos for a bunch of bands at the t- at that time too, but I don't think I did any vocals. No, for uh, right, so, so maybe solo. Yeah, I meant. Yeah. Um, and that's when Brian, 2019, Brian came back into the band, right? Yeah, and so yeah, that and again that was cool because what was twenty? We did the Hamburg Festival, which was super cool, and I feel like there was some other other well, i'm trying to look at the posters on my wall i feel like there were some other cool shows but yeah that that hamburg one was great uh, getting to play that festival and again it's one of the ones where they're in edmonton we're in saskatoon so we met up in germany and we kind of did our our rehearsal in the it was similar to not quite the same bunk bed setup that me and ed had but it was kind of a, a similar thing set up like that and, you know brian was playing drums on the on the the bunk beds and you know we were unplugged playing and that's how we did our rehearsing for that but that was super cool and and led us to basically yeah did, played a few more shows i think we did one with warbringer or something and then we were going to do the juno fest which junos are kind of like the canadian grammys we were going to be playing with striker and that was right that was the beginning of the the nonsense no, they're not. Yeah, but who can forget the nonsense? Um, in 2019, that's also when you the uh, Raven Witch, right? Which is like a heavy yes. metal band that you do. So that began th- that same year. Yeah. So the perfect time to start a band. But yeah. So yeah, that's just again uh, me and my wife kind of just wanted to do like a band that was like early Scorpions, Thin Lizzy, kind of like more in the you know like early Ozzy Osbourne, like inspired by that type of stuff. And it's just meant to be fun or whatever but anything we do i still like you know doing the the real professional recordings and still playing shows and stuff but yeah that's been super cool and it it's fun to not be the the front person of the band and you know i can kind of what is the lineup for that band what is your your band what is your band lineup for that group okay so tristan matheson he's the drummer he's our drummer he plays in another band called battle x um then there's uh me i i play guitar we got our uh, Jordan Lees is the bass player. His nickname's Meatball. My wife, Erin Lindsay, she's the vocalist. And then we've got Matt Haynes back in the band. He was the original Untimely Demise guitarist. And before that, it was Noel Wilcox, who was also in Untimely Demise. 
So I, you like guys, I say, please go put out singles, right? You guys haven't done a record yeah, yet. Yeah, we've got right now. We're putting, we're working on a EP. So we got four drum tracks for the new uh, EP, and I think we'll do that. I'd like to do LPs, but ultimately we just kind of make things work in time. You know, I, I, I'll sock away at a song here or there, but just don't, don't ever have the same kind of time because, uh, yeah, after after COVID or whatever, I got a, a job at the city landfill. So I'm kind of like, I still have like a, a, a normal job that I, that kind of burglars a lot of my time. But uh, yeah, we're going to be putting out an EP with both on Timely Demise and Raven, which within the year or so. And with writing records, man, don't you think now it's like, you know, me and Ed have always done records. We've done like full lengths. So, you know, you do some EPs or some splits, but now it feels like the trend is like, it, it sucks, but I, it's hard. Like some bands just don't put out, especially like you know, some, the Judas Priest still put out records yes. and stuff like that. But a lot of like the underground, it seems like a great record, right? We, we, yeah, we talk about that a lot on the show. Actually, that one. Um, it seems like some of, now it's a lot of younger bands are just doing like three songs, or you know, because obviously the attention span is like nothing now, basically. Yeah, well, it's the attention span, and then like it's just like there's no. Um, I guess benefit to putting out an album it seems like you know what i mean because uh like if you just put out a single you know it's like one twelfth the work and you get the same kind of you know press and and attention and then you can keep putting out singles and you can keep getting the radio because it's like brand new but you know if you put out an album and say it doesn't immediately get played within the next week or so you know sometimes it can kind of just then that's it and and maybe people heard one of the songs or, but the other 12 are fantastic and no one even heard them. And, and I, I, that's the one thing I've never been able to crack. Like, how do you get people to listen to the music? I just don't Dude, know. We talk about this all the time how to do it, but I'm going to keep putting it out and keep trying, but I just don't have that answer when, you know, y- younger people will ask me, you know, like, how do you, how do you do this? And I'm like, I don't know. Like I really, and I refuse to be someone that's going to spend my hard earned money paying for someone else to, you know, get me play or this or that. And then it's just a bunch of bots listening to the song. It's like, I, you know, I'm kind of a bit jaded with that. What do you think the lifespan is of a record? Because we talk, I I actually say it's usually about two good weeks that when a new record comes out, this is the time you have to get it to people because there's, I'm not even going to admit, there's a couple of bands that we both love Ed that are from, that are bigger bands that put out albums recently. And I haven't heard for the first two weeks, you constantly hear about the record. Especially for me and Ed. Yeah. That Megadeth Man, or, record came and went, man. I mean, yeah. it was like we were talking about it, and then you're not talking about it. And yeah. it was a good record. Oh, yeah, a no. bunch. And like even like the last Exodus and Creator Records and stuff, like you say, they come and they go. And DSI just put out a record. I heard about a shitload when it first came out. Now you don't. It's like kind of already getting to that period a couple weeks later. Yeah, like I, I – I would say, yeah, a few weeks if, if it hasn't picked up the momentum. I, I don't really, it's, that's kind of a, a sign. And, and in general, when I listen to new records, you know, like with the Invincible Shield or whatever, I, I like just burning them into my brain. So I'll get the new yeah. Priest record and then play it nine times a day for, for a week straight or whatever. Yeah, that's what you have to do, I think, because it's too easy. There's so much product out there now. It's so easy to, like, put out. you guys, you got to kind of drill it in a little bit, you know? Yeah, like, exactly. it takes me about a couple listens and stuff. But, yeah, it just seems like we always talk about that on here on the Tampa Morg that, like, you know, I remember when an album would come out in the – we're older than you, so I remember the late 80s or the 90s, like, you would just listen to that album every day for, like, a year or two. Oh. It just became part of the thing, you know? You carried it around with you to high school or middle school with cassette tapes or whatever. Yeah, well, that's the thing. And you and you were drawing the album art on your binders yep. and doing all that stuff where, I, again, that's the, the downfall of the singles and not necessarily attaching artwork and stuff to, to – you know, like, all it is now is, like, generally people put out a song and there'll be like a generic kind of, you know, um, what is that uh, lyric video type video that's made and that's it. But yeah, back in the day, it was, it was a lot cooler having, having the artwork, having the album, you know, you bring it, you're exchanging albums with buddies and stuff. Yeah. I was, I, I am very nostalgic for that, that old yeah, time. Yeah, great times. You know, and you, you know, we talk about, you talked about COVID before. So, and I was going to ask you about that when you guys put out Maverick, so did you guys start writing that during the pandemic's beginning? Cause it had to affect that record because it affected everybody's releases, like that, yeah, that time I, period. That, that was me. I kind of just got a handle on like how I can record myself in my apartment. And it was just, you know, me 8 a.m. on a Monday morning, you know, with your cup of coffee, just just 
writing riffs and arranging them and and yeah it was uh it was a different period you know like going from i'm used to writing songs where you hear the drums and you you feel the amps and stuff and then you know to to write the riffs at eight in the morning you know with your headphones on it was it was different but i don't know i i still am very pr- proud of that record and you know i i like showing it to people as uh that's something that I'm very proud of. It's some people don't like it cause it's a, a bit more melodic, but uh, yeah, it, I would definitely say that time period affected it for sure. And you said you guys are working on uh, new material for the next yeah, release. It, yeah. And the goal is to like, I think the main thing, like a harder edge more to the point and, you know, maybe a little less melodic, a little like less dynamic and trying to, trying to rein it back a bit to the, the stuff that I'm currently listening to, you know, where just, heavier you know direct songs maybe a little less like kind of musical nonsense and more just pound head down type of shit and that's what you so it's uh justin bender you so the, mary and brian yeah it's brian murray and i and then uh, oh, that's right the I, new guy i don't want to I, I don't want to speak for tyler but i imagine he'll be on the, okay. the album that's right as well that's cool man and you know vocally dude did you always want to do vocals or was that kind of something that like you know a lot of bands we have on here it's the same story like i didn't really want to do them at first but we couldn't find anybody to do them so you know yeah it's kind of a case where yeah it's a little bit of both like i i don't know if i want it i i like the idea of doing them but i didn't think i was good enough or capable of doing it but then it just i started doing it and then it's just again with me being able to do guitars and vocals and then Murray being able to do bass we're almost you know more than halfway there you know so it's just it, it makes sense if if I'm doing the vocals then we're not going to lose a vocalist halfway through or something you know but definitely and for you as a kid were you like into like what were some of the bands like you know obviously we mentioned like Razor earlier Exciter and stuff like that or you know were you getting into those those home bands for you those like I guess you say homegrown yeah. bands that you were around Yes and no. I feel like that came a bit later. Like I'm kind of your your standard guy, like a lot of metalheads, where the Judas Priest and the Iron Maiden, Megadeth, and to a lesser extent, even like Ingve Malmsteen and stuff. I, I heard that stuff and kind of became obsessed. But like Megadeth was my band for at least from 19 years old, probably into my thirties, but like in kitchens, we would play through, I bring my CD of Megadeth and we would go from killing is my business all the way up to even risk at the time or whatever. And we would play them all day, every day. And all the servers would come back and be like, man, don't you have anything else? And I'm like, <laughs> this is the news. So to me, that's the, yeah, exactly. So the theory, so with Megadeth, you know, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with P cells and killing is my business. Um, so far, so good was, you know, but I mean, Rust in Peace, I see it happening. I saw like this band developing it to be, it was going to get more mature. Like Mustaine yeah. wasn't yeah. running around with the red nose so much anymore. And like, um, but out of what was your, what would you say if you had to say your top? Cause I, I mean, I'm going to say killing is my business and peace sells is my top two only because that was my, I was a child back then and I was obsessed with those records yeah. to you. What was the, say your top couple Megadeth records. If you had yeah, to pick it's like peace sells. Rust in Peace, then probably Killing in my, is my business. And so far, really, really grew on me over the Hook years. Hook and Mouse, like, great. You know, like 502 and, and those types of, that, that type of riffing. I like kind of lifting a lot of those riffs off of that album and trying to use them for, for untimely riffs because I, I just love that erratic kind of sound. And then, but I'm a guy, like, I like you know, the, the euthanasia years where Dave's voice was really nice and, and the like guitar harmonies were really nice. And I actually really even like, um, what's the, the one that was going to be a solo album, the, uh, system has failed. I actually think that's a fantastic record. Is that the one that has like kick the chair on it and stuff? Yeah. Kick the chair, blackmail okay. the universe. It's just, that was actually when they first started getting to me, like, because I kind of like, like I said, I liked Rust in Peace, but I saw them on that, the Clash of the Titans tour, which was Rust in Peace. That was the, the album they were supporting, which Sick. I saw too. Yeah, I saw that at the Garden in New York, but I, I knew that something was changing a little bit. But like, when I heard the album um, System Has Failed, it did kind of have that old feel to it again, That you know, because I saw, I saw them, we used to go out to NAMM in California, which is like a big music yeah, conference yeah, thing. Yeah. And uh, Megadeth, it was the ESP party, and I, I've never seen Dave Mustaine look more unhappy. He was like, had to play for like there was fifty of us in this room, yeah. and it was just you know, but it was cool to see Dave Mustaine yeah. 
you know, in front of you playing. The guy's, you know, the guy is, has his own thing going on for sure. Yeah. Um, but that, that Killing album is great. And Peace Sells to me is, I would have to say Peace Sells is like the perfect mega Oh, record. it is. Like for me, just Chris Poland's jazzy phrasing and that, yep. that bubbly and Gar. Tone. Yeah, Gar is like, uh, the, the, again, those jazz, like that kind of cool beats that you wouldn't see in metal. I I, I thought, yeah, Killing is, is My Business is fan, fantastic. And I love the rawness of it. And I love that it's got all the mistakes. And yeah, just that yeah i could listen to that album every day ed sure. which one you got out of the out of the group we've already talked about it i'm a p sales guy yeah probably dave was of, just so pissed dave, off dave ellison well the bass was real prominent on that yeah. record dave yeah. ellison he yeah. let you know that was one of the bands where you heard the bass yeah uh, killing you could hear it on killing but i think dave ellison between that and even uh believe it or not last week I was just scrolling and I did listen to, uh, 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 shit. what's the one after killing? Um, we yeah, killing peace so far and then rust so far. Yeah. So far. And I was actually going, man, this is a better record than I remembered. Like yeah. it, it's, there's a couple songs on there that you were like, ah, but, the cover you know, song could go. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, in yeah. general covered songs for Megadeth aren't the greatest. Hook, hook and mouth though is a great. It's hey, hook and mouth ranks in the well, top ten Megadeth songs of all yeah. time. I mean, or even like, uh, in my darkest hour is a pretty. Ah, it's a great yeah. song. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was I was surprised that I was like, man, this one uh, snuck up on me because I forgot how good it was because yeah. it gets overshadowed by the other two, and of course, Rust in Peace, and then Countdown just kind of it went downhill for me. Yeah. A yeah. Bit. I don't mind the records too much, but that's when the radio killed them because they just overplayed those countdown yeah. songs yeah. and Absolutely. then the euthanasia songs were getting overplayed. And it was just like, this is, you know, kind of like Metallica, yeah. you know, they got overplayed. Like the yeah. black album got so overplayed that I, if, if I never heard that record again, I probably would, it would be okay. Yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing against Metallica, but yeah. We've those all songs it. have been, yeah, too many yeah. times, way yeah, too the, many times. With the peace cells though, again, that, that formula of writing where they had the, like Bad Omen and uh, what's the other one where they've got that the intro those eerie clean guitar intros Devil's like, Island yeah, right Devil, uh, yeah, My like, Last Words yeah like where like that you know similar to like a fade to black or something where it starts with this beautiful you know music and then it just gets heavy like I love that type like of the sound. Conjuring right or it was a yeah, black con- yeah the those? Conjuring yeah yeah yeah, yeah you know well, mentioned he still, Priest, he but still it. had a uh, I think he still had that urge to smash Metallica into oblivion yeah. at that point. Those first two records, he was on a mission to destroy yeah. fuck, Mars and James back into the Stone Age. And and if you ask me, if you listen to the records, you know, if you listen to like Ride the Lightning, which of course I'm not shooting on Ride the Lightning, the songs on that record are epic as fuck. Um, but if you put Megadeth's records aside that, you could yeah. tell who was faster, who was on fire. You know what I mean? You could tell who was really looking to yeah. make a mark at that yeah. point. Cause and, and even like that, the flashiness of the soloing and Megadeth is pretty like, like light years ahead of where, where Kurt Hammett was at at the time or whatever. So I, well, what, I think he had him in that, that aspect too. When I heard the black album, I, I swear I knew when I heard it, I couldn't stand it right away. Enter Sam and I dropped right out. And I was always more of a, there was something about a pissed off Dave Mustaine, a snarly, like I'd never, yeah. as a kid, I was, and I have to say that I think even the man, like his mindset, I kind of appreciated because he was just like, he would take anybody down just to get where he wanted to be back then. And I kind of like thought that was, I was like, wow, man, this guy's for real. You know, this guy's like, yeah. you couldn't put him in front of a microphone without bashing some yeah. of the old members like he just yeah. said what he felt man you know and it was just like that was when dave was young you know like when he was younger he was entertaining as hell especially you put him on an interview because you knew he was going to take a shot at somebody on uh, you know from metallica and it was yeah. just you know and you mentioned priest like i'm, I'm interested because you were born obviously uh later than us but what is your favorite priest record my favorite pre- okay so i freaking love sad wings of destiny like that so like that's going to be like a a possible one so i'd say sad wings painkiller obviously i had you know a phase where i probably listened to that for about 10 years straight and i i love that type of sound 
but yeah, I'd say sad wings, stained class, you know, that kind of, I, I like almost more of that, that seventies vibe, you know, where it was still had quite a bit of blues in it, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I love Painkiller. I remember when that came out, and it was like we were talking, always talking about Ed when he went to the record store. And it was like boxes open; you could just grab the tapes out or this, I guess, CDs. And back then, I was getting a lot of cassettes. But I think that Painkiller that may be their heaviest record. Dude, oh, yeah. that was that was a solid punch in the dick because you didn't expect Judas Priest to sound like that. No, you know, no. And that was Scott. That was Scott Travis, man. Oh yeah, you know the, the, that oh, that yeah. kind of that kind right of when that album really starts, his drums is what you first thing you hear is no, pretty much. Were, and, they and, uh, were they touring with Pantera at the time? I feel like there was like a tour of like I, Annihilator, Pantera, and Annihilator, Priest, another or, like another kind of Canadian band, Annihilator. Yeah. yeah. See, I saw when I saw Judas Priest on the Painkiller tour, Megadeth opened. Oh, and it sweet! Was, it was fucking. It was, uh, I was just cool. like, wow, this is, this is different. You know what I mean? Cause I was like, you got two killer bands on tour. I don't remember who the opener was. That, that's how great they were. But, yes. um, you know, they, they crushed and then he rode out on the, on the bike and fucking, they just started. And I was just like, holy shit, man. It was to be able to see that, you know, that's one thing about being an old fucker is, uh, I got to see shit that most people, these young bucks will never yeah. see. They'll never get to experience. They'll never understand the early Slayer yeah. days, no. the early Me- Metallica days, the early Megadeth days. Seeing bands, even uh, like uh, just even staying up at Headbangers right. Ball on Saturday nights just yeah, to see a man. metal video yeah. because you didn't get to see that shit in the daytime. That's right. Yeah, man. You know, yeah, it's a different world. What was your first concert you ever went to, man? Do you remember? Uh, Matt, like, like uh, first concert or first metal yeah. concert? No, for, for us, oh, yeah, actually both. Go ahead. Okay, first concert, New Kids on the Block. Holy shit. Right? <laughs> so, a band that's never been mentioned on the show before. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was my uh, uh, intro to live music. It was pretty, I was like, like I don't know, I'm going to five or six. I don't know how old I was. Pretty young, but yeah, that, that was fun. But uh, first metal concert, uh, well, like, I don't know if it's metal, but like uh, I went to Edmonton when I was 16 and saw Bad Religion. They were my favorite band at the time. Oh, Bad Religion's so that's a, great. That's a punk band. Yeah. And then as far as metal, first metal band, uh, probably seeing Megadeth with Exodus again, but this it, is still it, not even that long ago, maybe, you know, like 15 or maybe like 20 years ago or something. But was that your first, was Megadeth your first record? What was the first record you ever picked up? First record, uh, well, Murray came, uh, when he came back from Vancouver, when he was joining the punk band, when we were starting that up, he came back with Black Flag. I f- it's the one with the, it's like all smashed or whatever. Yep. A Black Flag he came back with uh, Angel of De- or Rain and Blood, Slayer, and then Dead Kennedys, Give Me Convenience, Give Me Convenience or Give Me Death. So yeah, Slayer was like the first kind of metal that was brought into our house. And then we got uh, Iron Maiden, Best of the Beast. And we had uh, got, brought in, I want to say it was like a Megadeth Best of or whatever. But that that's again when it started switching us from out of our punk phase to we're like, oh man, we want to start playing this real music. Like, you know. And your parents were, were your parents all supportive and stuff? They're very supportive of, of, of the music. Like throughout the years, we had bands crashing at our parents' place all the time and, you know, let us jam there and make noise. And, you know, they always, you know, the next day after a show, they'd come out and be like, so how many people were there? How many CDs did you sell? You know, kind of stuff. They, they My dad really liked, the, you know, like the business aspect of, you know, it's and yeah, they, they've Are they surprised it. where you've taken it? Like when, you know, you say, hey, I'm going to Europe to go tour here or I'm going to do this. Are they kind of like, oh shit, I guess mary and matt were you know they, they were onto something oh yeah i i think they're proud obviously with with most parents and stuff it seems like the financial aspect is where they would be they they'd be more <laughs> proud of, you know, can but, you buy a house doing this when you could buy yeah, yeah. yeah. but you no know, they're they've always been supportive and just super proud i think that's cool man that's definitely cool man and we really appreciate you coming on matt today i know yeah, we, this is uh, awesome it's great talking to you guys yeah man and will anybody who wants to find like anything to do with you know so okay so into eternity when you have what's going on with them is you got anything new coming up with that project yeah right you now we're kind of just demoing stuff it's not like we're super you know full-blown but we just did that manitoba metal fest we're going to be recording new music over the year and then uh 
uh, Raven Witch and Untimely Demise. We're doing the EPs this year, so that's what we'll do. And then we'll just we'll book at least some some shows around that. And with Untimely Demise, I know Murray's always looking for if there's an opportunity to get us on a, a festival or a date or whatever. We'll get grants and build something around that. So that that that's kind of our short term plan for right now is just keep writing the music and they keep putting it out and finding some, finding some cool dates to, to play. Nice, man. And where can I, you got what Instagram? Oh, go ahead. Anywhere that people can find anything to do with uh, untimely demise or yeah, untimely Tony, demise. We got our Facebook, we got our Instagram and then, yeah, you know, there's same thing with all the bands, your, your Facebook, your Instagrams. And I've got a Matt Cuthbertson guitar, but I'm, I'm like semi keep up with that. I just, yeah, it's nice, nice, man. Well, Ed, anything? So we, yeah, that was really cool. You came out, hang out. I know it was short notice, man. It was a couple of days ago. I was like, Matt, why don't you uh, come on the show? And then we threw it all together, man. So you know, we tried to. Uh, this dude was fucking me up because I'm doing some. Oh, he Ed smashing apart his house and eh? oh, dude, I, well, I was putting up this. My wife wanted to do. Uh, we're painting. We have. I've been living in this house for 24 years, and we've yeah. never done shit. Yeah. And she decided I want to paint everything and. We decided we were going to do like a shiplap wall or two walls. Yeah. And it always sounds easier than it is. I sent him a picture. He's like blowing up my, you know, the phone. And I'm like yeah. in the middle of with a fucking giant gun in my hand, you know, <laughs> fucking trying to, to yeah. shoot nails in the wall. And the phone's ringing. And I'm like, and Bryce is like, it was a Tony. And I'm like, fuck him. See, I'm the one. I, I have to book the show, so I book every. We've we've had like. Yeah. So let me oh, tell yeah. you, Matt. Yeah. Ed will tell you, we've had this is our fifty third show. We've That's had a great. shitload of guests. We've had, you know, Ed. What's we can actually say some of the guests now because for the listeners who also we've had uh, Chris from Autopsy come on. We had uh, Gene Vince from Crowley. Angel Corpse, Vincent Crowley from Asheron. We had Bobby from Overkill, Bobby G cool. from back in the day. We've Pat had from Hell Witch. Pat from Hell Witch. We've had Snowy Dave Shaw from, from King Savage. Diamond and Merciful Fate. We've Dang, had a shitload. And we yeah. book them ourselves, man. We pretty much wow. like we, we kind of like the clown on. Okay, we had yeah art from Terrifier. Uh, my wife, when she was looking up, up the, the yesterday, she's like, "They had Art the Clown." Yeah, for she what for two did. hours he was on over two yeah, hours. That dude is fucking awesome. awesome, man. Yeah, Sick. yeah, yeah. So, we've had yeah, a bunch. Well, my book, everybody. So it's a pain in the ass because only because you have to like. I'm like, okay, so like, well, we're booking Matt. I'm like, okay, what time zone is this guy on? Because I'm over in Eastern Europe right now, and Ed's yeah. over in Tampa. Yeah. So we have to do this like yeah. pyramid of like figuring out times, you know? That's so it's why like, I thought I would send you a message today to make sure, like, is what is this the time or whatever? I'm glad and you did because we were off by yeah, an hour. <laughs> yeah, 11 worked out better for me. So this is per- that was perfect. Yeah, because yeah, we well, I, told me, him. I remember he, he sent me a, because if I don't answer, he sends me a message. Yeah. And says, I booked hey, this I want, guy on this time. He goes, I want to get Matt on. Are you good for this time? And I just, I, I look at it real quick and I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, that'll work. Yeah. But I'm saying, yeah. I'm getting, and I send him a picture and he goes, okay, cool. I'll set it up. That looks like shit. Or like, you know, what did you say? <laughs> no, that looks like absolute. We're douches to each other. Hell. That's what we do. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, you, were, you were like, you were like, that looks like hell to fucking what you're working on. Oh yeah, like, dude. dude. I'm What's Florida temperatures right now? Yeah. Well, it's not even that. I'm working with my son, so I'm ready to fucking send him into oblivion. <laughs> yeah, so that's how we thinks, put, I, see how pro we are here. We book our show. Uh, it all comes from love. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. Yeah, but Matt, we totally appreciate you coming on, man. You're always welcome. You know, we could always, and whenever you get some tunes, send them to us. We'll play them Hell and stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, it, yeah, it was great seeing you guys, and thanks so much. And we'll we'll see you again soon. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Everybody else, Ed, where can they get? Let's do the spiel. You can. Uh, find us everywhere pretty much yeah facebook instagram anywhere uh you stream podcast your stream. podcast you know apple spotify freaking amazon i've been he's hearing keep hearing people say they're streaming yeah. on amazon now so that's a good one uh the tampa morgue at gmail.com yeah, that's you right send us more hate mail because uh you know we love hate mail and Who does uh, it? yeah yeah, and oh, there's a shitload of back. Like anybody can go back and listen to a bunch of the old shows. Everything is on there. Um, most of them are on YouTube, um, but you can always find them on, like he said, Spotify, anywhere the podcasts are streamed. Absolutely. Uh, we have, we what do we have here? 26th next week. We have uh, Belzebub from Mystic Circle from Germany coming on. August 7th we have King Fally from Deceased coming on, and uh, October 31, and that should be an awesome show because King is uh, definitely uh, not only a legendary dude, but just 
doesn't hold back at all. Say, if uh, if bloody if bloody mess didn't get us canceled, come on, kid, <laughs> yeah. bring it on, bring it on. Yeah, yeah, we had bloody f mess on a couple weeks ago, talking about how he spent time with John Wayne Gacy on death row oh. for like eighteen hours. It just and that's just a that's the Disney version of the whole story. Yeah, that's fucking Matt. badass. <laughs> Yeah, we, it, it was a very episode is very uh, interesting, but um, yeah, we thank anybody who listens to us. We'll be back with uh, Bells Above from Mystic Circle, like I said, on the 26th. I think that's going to be the next show. I'm heading out to Lafia on Thursday for a couple of days. So um, yeah, everybody who listens, we really appreciate it. Matt, again, thanks again for hanging, dude. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. And uh, everybody else, we'll see you next week on the Tampa Morgue. Peace. See ya.